And now I think we have uh, the first introductory slide and um, we will have Staying Critical All the Way by Marcos. Thank you, Carsten. I hope audio quality is okay from far, far, far off where you are. And hello and welcome to everybody also from my side. It's always exciting to have a webinar with you guys. We collect a lot of feedback, so we always look very much forward um, to you guys giving comments to what we say, what we have, and especially what we program, of course. Today, I would like to sharpen your minds and eyes uh, for things that uh, people often stumble about or disregard. Um, sometimes we all do not pay attention to things that we should pay attention to. And this webinar is about all these things in structure-based rock design. What we will learn today is um, a quality assessment of crystal structures, not for the experts, but for the non-experts. So for people who are not really very deep into the uh, crystal structure modeling, recording, etc., but things where we can relatively easy pay attention to. And uh, if time permits, we'll also use a bit of free software to uh, look into a few details there. We will think about tautomers, about protonation and various associated things. And we will prepare a receptor uh, from the very beginning so that we can, can continue to work with it in structure-based ligand design. Further on, we'll learn about visual assistance when we look at structures, at poses, at designs that we make with two um, points here that we pay special attention to, namely torsional significances, something that we and Roche and Hamburg University have worked a lot on in the past and about the visualization of desolvation issues that play uh, quite a big role actually in drug design as you probably already know. I'll try to spice everything with a few applications here and there so uh, that you guys um, can look at structures which is always the most exciting things for people in drug design at least work-wise. So before we really kick off um, this webinar allows us to um, to listen to you. And with this, I would like to hand over back to Carsten for a few seconds, uh, because we would like to know a little bit about you. Carsten? Yes, um, we have prepared this poll um, to know what kind of professional you are. And um, we will have the poll up now. You can <coughs> select one of the following. Are you a computational chemist? Are you a medicinal chemist? Are you a biologist, a crystallographer, or maybe none of the above? So I can see the answers coming in here. We'll give you a few more seconds. And uh, I will close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. OK, brilliant. Oops. Yep. Sorry. So yeah, actually, actually, um, almost fifty percent of you guys are medicinal chemists, followed by the computational chemists, a few biologists, uh, a very few are crystallographers, and six percent actually uh, choose none of the above. Thank you. So let's continue then. So that definitely helps me pitching the webinar a little bit better. It's uh, it's actually pretty much what I assume would happen, so that we have more or less 40-40 CompChem, MedChem, uh, and a few specialists that can always uh, comment on things, of course, during the time here. Crystal structure quality. So recently I met uh, Derek Lowe, whom you may know from his just fabulous blog, um, uh, which actually uh, recently moved uh, the site. So if you just Google him, you'll, you'll find his blog pretty high up in the uh, ranking list, in the um, results list. And he, when I showed him our new baby here, he said, you know, we tend to believe that PDB files are really a message from God. And um, of course, what he implied there is that a PDB file that we work with is actually only a model, of course. And um, 
to avoid being trapped in this phrase just being a common place, we would like to put a little bit more details to these things. So when we start out here, we would have to think about how is a PDB, a PDB file actually created? Well, in principle, what we do is we fit an initial atomic model, so kind of a guess driven by sequence and things that we know, to an observed density. Once we have this, we simulate the diffraction of this model that we just put in, of course, using a computer, and we, we compare the density um, that we have observed with the density that we have computed. According to the difference here, we move atoms, typically using a force field, sometimes prior knowledge, sometimes uh, in implied knowledge, so that this fit between observed and computed is improved. And finally, where we need, um, we do manual adjustments. So for example, certain flips, certain things that we know from, from maybe a small molecule crystal structure or other knowledge that we have. And of course, this is not just a sequential process, but there is lots of iterations in here and it's way more complicated, of course, than just these, three, these uh, four steps here. What I wanted to tell you with this slide here is that more or less in, in every stage here, we have some kind of, of modeling, some kind of fitting, some kind of computing, some kind of, of adjusting things um, where, we, where we sometimes need the computer or oftentimes actually need the computer. And, um, and in the end, it's not just the reflection of an experiment that we have, but there is a lot of things flowing into there being modeled. So stopping here, just again for a second, what is it that you guys look out when you check crystal structures? Do you check them at all? So again, I would like to hand over to Carsten uh, for a quick feedback um, questionnaire here. Uh, yeah, hang on a sec, I think. Do you see the poll or you don't? Not yet. Oh, I thought I, I think I did make click too quickly here and I already closed the poll. Let's see how I can, uh, yeah, well, it was a technical glitch here. I apologize. Um, no problem. I can't, I can't reopen the polls anyway. Yeah, once once they are done, they are done. That's right. So if you do a double click, it's just, oh, yeah, no, no worries. So essentially what I wanted to know is um, what we sometimes hear in industry is that people trust their experts. So it's really a responsibility split. The crystallographers do the crystallographic checks and that's it. And nobody later on worries about these things anymore. Uh, many people look a lot at, uh, uh, look, sorry, look a lot at resolution. Uh, several people look, look at R factors, free R factors, etc. And sometimes people also inspect visually. They check for clash and things like this. And uh, we'll do a, a bunch of these things in due course. So, how will I know whether my structure is really okay? Um, actually, uh, I'll give a few pointers here for you guys to check. The PDB website has an educational resource now. Perhaps you don't know, but if we click on this guy here, uh, my browser should pop up and uh, I'm dragging this over here. So, Carsten, can people see this? Can people see my browser? Yes, they can. Some, someone I'm says... I, I'm seeing the browser. Yeah, somebody says, I cannot hear, uh, but this seems to be a local problem then there. So what I wanted to point you to is um, that there is a wonderful um, introduction uh, section here on the PDB website, which really helps you understand things. So maybe kind of a homework uh, if you want to just check these web pages. They are beautifully written, very condensed, and especially also for the non-experts of very high value. Um, going back to the slides, the next resource that I can recommend is that below every PDB file, well, maybe not every, every, but um, most of, of the ones that I've seen lately, they introduced a new display to check quality, which is really nice. So you have um, bad on the left-hand side and good on the right-hand side with kind of a simple statistical fingerprint that helps you assessing whether you're, you're in, a, in a rather good situation or maybe not so much. 
the PDB text file itself contains information. So if you just open it with a text editor, you can really take a look at things such as resolution, etc. in case you do not find them on the PDB website. And certainly also uh, there are density maps. So if you really want to visualize things, uh, there are tools out there. We'll do this in a second. So one caveat. Uh, this is also taken from the PDB website. Obviously, that was generated with the Aztecs viewer here. It gives you a feel for what resolution uh, or a feeling for, for resolution. So sometimes people say, well, my crystal structure isn't that bad. I have a resolution of 2.5 or something like this. But you see with 2.5, 2.7 here in this example, you are already in, in, a, in a relatively vague uh, region here. You could fit this fennel ring a lit, little bit further up north or south or even west and east. With three angstroms, essentially you just have a volume. You don't have shape anymore. So when you talk about really atom, atomic good resolution here, you really, really need to get down to relatively small values, such as one angstrom, two angstrom, somewhere in between. So this is really, really something where you'd say this is really good quality. So um, let's try. Let's try to actually um, uh, do that and visualize something. So I stop the presentation here for a second, and um, I will call it a tool called Coot, C O O T, uh, which is the standard for uh, crystallographic visualization, modeling, etc. out there. And this tool can actually be uh, freely downloaded. So you can just download it and get a go. So um, it fires up here. I enlarge this a little bit. And then pretty easily now, you can actually uh, download a PDB file, including the associated density. So there is a file menu up here. And in this file menu here, we have fetch PDB and map using the electron density server here, for example, from Sweden. Uh, usually this works pretty neatly. And it asks you for a PDB um, session code. So let's use one, oops, let's use one J three J for example, and click get it. So you see in the background, it's now contacting the uh, server in Sweden. And once it's done, it will just show you uh, the structure and the density. And here it is. So now with a shift right click, you can zoom in and zoom out. And with the left mouse click, you can rotate so that you can actually navigate in the structure. There is a nice little button, which is the go to the next ligand. Uh, button up here, uh, just right below the menu. Hopefully you can see where my little mouse is here underneath validate in the menu, which says go to the next ligand. So uh, before we actually do this, we can rotate this a little bit uh, so that you can get a feeling for what this structure is like. Uh, and I'm going to go to the next ligand, which is this guy here. So what you see is that there is density, sometimes more, sometimes less, and sometimes there is no density at all. So for example, up here, there is no density, but there is a little bit of density down here. So the crystallographer has some kind of freedom to actually put the O here and the N there or the other way, the other way around. There are also, besides the blue density that you see here, there is sometimes red density. And red density means that the computed density is larger than the observed density. So essentially, um, there wasn't any density there, but the crystallographer uh, found some, some reason to actually model the structure there. So this is not a particularly bad example here. It's just one example of um, what a PDB file um, actually reflects, namely a model of an observed density here. And you also see that, for example, the, the, the distances, et cetera, seem to be not exactly right since that is an aromatic ring here, but it has been modeled with simply two double bonds here in that ring. So careful with these things. If we hop to the next ligand, 
you see again with the mouse wheel you can by the way uh, increase the um, the iso surfaces here you see that this happens again here with this ligand here almost no density back there next ligand again something where where we do not have full experimental evidence for things etc etc so i advise you strongly here it's even more drastic i advise you strongly to just download CUD or any other freeware tool out there which visualizes densities and check your structures before you actually take them as granted, take them as a message uh, from God and continue your work. Okay, back to the presentation. So we looked at density maps here and um, I showed you how easy it is to do a quick check before you continue with the structure. So you saw this bit of the of the slide before, uh, where I just uh, gave reference to the four stages, um, fitting an initial model, computing a fit and comparing the two model using a force field so that the fit is improved, maybe do manual adjustments, etc. So besides a resolution that people pay attention to relatively often, um, there is something that I would want to, to point your attention to, namely the R factor. So if a structure is just perfect, this R factor will simply vanish. It's kind of, let's say, it's kind of a measure uh, between um, the observed density and the, and the computed density in here. So if there is no difference, then this R factor goes to zero. If you have a totally random structure, this would amount to roughly 0.36 here. And for typical structures, we have values around 0.2. So the smaller, the better. How come it's not zero? Well, there are plenty of factors influencing the uh, this fit. Of course, there is water. There are water channels, complicated water networks, etc., cetera, um, introducing some, some kind of fuzziness. And the thing is not static. There are vibrations. So uh, sometimes B factors can be considerably large and, uh, and things move in your protein. Uh, there is also disorder um, that creates um, these differences from perfection and so on and so forth. So there is um, a so-called free R factor that people uh, can pay attention to. And this is um, an R factor which avoids these situations here by taking something out of the observed and, doing it, uh, and putting it in, the, um, in a separate thing. Um, we'll speak about this in a second. So the problem here is we have simulations everywhere. It's simply a model and the experiment is used to fit the experiment back again. So we have kind of an of a loop which, uh, which can be summarized in minimize the R factor as the exercise during which we uh, have to live here with these stages. So to avoid this again, um, we should take something like a free R factor. And so it goes like this, we, re we, re we remove 10% of the observations and we simulate a density or a diffraction with the remaining 90% and we take this to predict the 10% here. And uh, even though not perfect, it still helps to avoid the, the loop that we take the experiment to predict the experiment itself. Um, the take-home message would be you use the resolution, of course, but also look at the free R factor and pay attention to this. Typically, it's a little bit larger than the, um, than the R factor. So we had this, we had this, we had this. More relevant issues. Resolution, yes. Is there electron density at all? Yes, we had that. The R free. Assignments, we'll do this in a second. Uh, flexibility. Yeah, you may want to visualize um, the uh, the B factors, for example, in your protein structures. There may be fluctuations with respect to chains. We'll also have this later on in the examples. There is one example here on the slide, one IAL, for example, where the um, methionine 25 differs quite significantly significantly between chain A and B. And um, also, do we actually have a bioactive conformation? I told you uh, how to do this in CUDE, uh, fetch the PDB and map using the electron density server, and so on and so forth. So with this, let's proceed to step number two. How about protons, tautomers, etc.? So you will know uh, from, 
from your basic courses probably that in X-ray diffraction typically we cannot see any protons. They simply do not scatter enough. We don't see the um, <clears throat> the associated density. So we don't have any proton information, which means that if we want to continue in structure-based design, we must predict the proton positions as good as possible. But it's not only about the protonation states, but also tautomers may be required. So this is something which is not so easy to resolve, which is why there is software out there to actually help us here. So here's an overview of the most used um, software packages that are out there. There is What If, which exists since long, long. There is Protonate 3D, which is um, integrated in Mo from the Chemical Computing Group, Hint CT. There is an older version of Protoss, which we wrote up in combination or in collaboration with Hamburg University. There is the uh, well-known Yazara package. And there is a new Protoss version out from us, which is continuously uh, improved. So what's the task of all these? Well, we have a protein side and we do have a ligand side. In the protein, we have rotatable hydrogen, so OH functions, etc. We have the tautomer problem. We have the protonation state problem. Is there a proton at all or is it deprotonated? Side chain flips, we'll come to this in a second. Water orientations and so on and so forth. Um, on the ligand side, we have similar problems to worry about. Rotatable hydrogens, tautomers, protonation states, and also side chain flips. Uh, with the advent of the new protos here, we can actually put tick marks uh, at all of these uh, places so um, so that we are now in a position to actually give you an automated proposal to start with. Yeah? So we'll, we'll look at this in detail now in a second when we do an overall receptor preparation. We'll use a tool from us for this. Um, all these stages you can do uh, without paying for anything. Actually, you download lead it and you do the receptor preparation and um, and then uh, then you learn about your, your protein, your binding site, etc. So let's do this. I'm going to fire up uh, lead it here, um, just down here. I'm shrinking this a little bit so that we can properly see everything. And um, don't pay attention to every button that I click here. Essentially, I want to convey where we have to pay attention, right? So I just use a very simple protein here, use it from the PDB server. Um, maybe um, one STP, whatever it is. That's a biotin thing. So here it is. So there is a ligand identified in the protein. We can take a look at the PDB text contents here on the left-hand side. Check, for example, the R value, the free R value here, which is actually not specified, which could already alert us a little bit. The R value, although is relatively small with 0 0.00. The resolution is high, 2.6 angstrom. So it's not really uh, what we would have wished for, but this paper is also uh, a little older already. So we say, uh, take me to the next step here, and we can take a look at things in a little bit more detail. If we had multiple chains, we would be prompted to check the chain uh, that we want to continue to work with. Actually, it's a question uh, that should be answered properly because usually we have pretty big differences from chain to chain. Yeah? And uh, you may want to wisely select your chain and pay attention to resolution, et cetera, and density with respect to, to, to the various chains. So we can carve out a binding site um, volume by distance. Typically, we take 6.5 angstroms. If you need larger, take it a little bit larger, but consider that for a further proton, uh, for, for further structure-based modeling, the larger a model you offer to your algorithms, the more freedom the algorithm also has to do things wrong. So here, um, now we are prompted to resolve chemical ambiguities. And let's take a look, for example, this glutamine 24 here, which is in the, in the um, southeast of the protein. What kind of freedom do we have from a crystal structure that we have? Well, actually, the crystallographer can often hardly distinguish be between an N and an oxygen. So there may be flips associated, something like this. I have clicked to the flipping thing here. Yeah? So you may want to check. 
And depending on this, maybe a water should be included or should not be included. Depending on your selection, you may want to reconsider this. For the serine here, this is an example of a degree of freedom with respect to the rotation of the OH function. Yeah? Lead it does help you here by giving you protos pre-computed orientations of the hydrogens. Still, you would want to check it's only a computer. And finally here, we have a histidine, which is back here. And histidines, even though this is a little bit further away from the ligand, you still may want to check with your histidines and your structures, whether it's actually this structure here or whether it's this structure. Yeah, so we can actually uh, see that the proton can, um, can hop and also it can flip. So we, are, we cannot really be sure if we have a ro pseudo rotation about this bond or not. So if I take the flip check mark here in the, in the lower left, we can see that the nitrogen and carbon change their positions. I do this again for you guys to see. One, two, three, and it changes. So these are the things that you may want to worry about. Of course, waters you may want to worry about. Should I include them, dis discard, uh, disregard them, etc. And small molecules may need fixes, as we have seen with the wrong assignment of the aromatics um, in CUD just a few minutes ago. So we say next, and we say finish, and we can give it a name, and then our receptor preparation is actually done. So with this, I wanted to take you through the, uh, through the necessary stages of a receptor preparation, at least things to pay attention to and stay critical along the way of your modeling. The good news is that our new baby, our new baby software here that we have called CSAR, this takes all this off your shoulders. Wait a little bit, we'll, uh, we'll fire up uh, CSAR in a few minutes and then you can take a look at how easy this goes then. The fourth point is scoring. Oh my dear, scoring. Um, this is definitely one of the hardest nuts to crack in our field. And typically what people do is they use some kind of an empirical scoring or force field. How does this go? Well, people make an observation. They say, for example, H bonds and some kind of surface bearing surface, protein surfaces is important. And they parameterize things such as a my score is some kind of function of the number of H bonds and the difference of solvent accessible surface area. Then we find out pi pi interactions contribute too. So we may include a pi pi term and so on and so forth, more entropy terms. And what we arrive at in the end is something like my all time favorite score is a, is a, is a sum over weights times the terms reflecting the observations I had. The problem is that typically we have way more than 50 parameters in this and we have parameterization and its associated problems, which is really a nightmare. I know what I'm talking about because I did this in my past and um, we don't really exactly know where we stand. It's just a parameterized system. Not so good. We would love to be able to do, to do somehow better. And typically this is what these force fields look like. So um, this is, uh, this is taken from, from something Germany. Here we have bind, Bindung, which is bonding, uh, Winkel, like Engel, dihedrals, non-bonded interactions, and even couplings in, in there. The pros are obvious. It's a fast and very, very quickly computed, analytical and understandable way of describing energy. But the cons are also pretty obvious. The additivity is unphysical. It just helps us doing a model. The parameterization is a nightmare and possibly we even um, get discontinu discontinuities, atom collapse, which should not be there and so on and so forth. So it's something that we really don't like. And uh, sometimes we still have to have to have to use these force fields because we are standing with our backs to the wall and we don't have any better. So roughly like 12, 13 years ago, uh, Bayer, and um, Hamburg University and ourselves said, okay, let's just rewind, go back to zero, and let's find out if we cannot do somehow better. So at this point in time, we said, what is it really affinity? What is it in, 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 the, in the deepest sense of it? It's a difference between two states. It's a difference between before and after. That means it's a difference be between an unbound state in water and a bound state in a complex. That means we would have to compute the difference 
with respect to this scenario here, where we have to free this ligand then from water and free the cavity from water, put it in here and maybe compute, you know, surviving waters, etc. This is the difference that it's all about. And with this, let's do another thought experiment here. Let's assume we had an exposed hydrophobic part of a ligand, which is totally surrounded by water. We have two subcavities. We have one here on the left-hand side. We have one on the right-hand side. And we ignore all torsional rearrangement and clash, etc. We just look at this situation and do the thought experiment of asking ourselves, if we have a fennel which is fully surrounded by an H2O in this pose here, is this good or bad for affinity? So with this, Carsten, I would like to hand over, don't double click, only one, please, <laughs> with, yeah. to, um, to trigger the next um little questionnaire here for you guys yeah this time it worked so we would like to know um if you guys think um if is this is good or bad for affinity that fennel ring that's sticking out into the solvent is it bad uh the fennel is obviously hydrophobic is it good the fennel pushes uh water away that's good for the entropy doesn't matter or i have no idea you could please give me uh, your answers, and I'll give you some more time because this is obviously um, a little bit of a brain teaser, or maybe not for some of you. I see more votes coming in here. Okay, I'll give you just a few more seconds. I will close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Okay. So obviously, um, the majority thinks that it's bad for the affinity. Um, that's uh, not the majority, but the forty percent of the people. Um, then 22% um, think it's good. The fennel pushes the uh, H2O away, which is good for the entropy. And also 22% don't really know. Um, and 17% say it does not matter. Marcus, what's the answer? Well, obviously that was a schematic. Um, so it was really about the principles that I, that I was trying to find out. And this uh, was a much more colorful outcome than I usually have this when I talk to people in front of me. Very interesting. So the answer is it doesn't matter. Um, but to, to, to get this right, we do not want to have a fennel ring, which is a hydrophobe, exposed in water in a drug. This is, of course, something that we want to avoid. But in terms of contribution to affinity, this fennel ring here was already unhappy before. And it still is. Let me repeat this, because usually it goes click then in people's minds. For the affinity, it doesn't contribute because the fennel ring in the water was already unhappy. It wanted to get out of the water. It's a hydrophobe. But in terms of the difference, and this is what affinity is, the difference is the difference of energetics before and after. The unhappiness was already there before, and it still is there. So since there are no other terms here contributing such as new H bonds or so that are formed upon um, entering the fennel into into the water here there is no contribution in this schematic view and again to to make this clear it's not that we want this in a drug of course we would like the fennel ring to contribute favorably in in creating affinity so we want to remove it from water bury it deep deep in a pocket or so but in this scenario here it doesn't contribute. We'll see this visualized in a few minutes. So the thing to worry about is desolvation payments. So look at this scenario here. We have an inhibitor which forms very nice hydromonds here to these three um, hydromond donors. It's actually a published PDB structure and the PDB code is 1044. And if we compare this to another published inhibitor in the PDB structure 1048, we see that we lose affinity by two orders of magnitude. Now, why is this? It is because these two here, the serine 36 OH group 
and the NH function of 3-38 here are now unsatisfied, which means they are no longer facing water in front of the face and they also have no interaction formed. So they are doubly unhappy. They have to pay desolvation because they have something in front of their face, but it is something that does not, uh, that does not form an interaction. So they are not rewarded with happiness upon forming an H bond. For medicinal chemists, this is a relatively obvious thing. They are used to think in that way. But for us fellow computational chemists, this is something that we really only start to learn how important it is. Of course, it's kind of obvious when you talk about it, but a force field, for example, a classical force field, does not take this into account at all. So it just sees, hmm, this has a, this has a contribution, so it gives it an award. These are kind of muted here, these two. They are not contributing unfavorably in a force field computation, although they should. So take home message is unsatisfied age bonds can lead to 100 fold change in delta G. Please keep this or in affinity, I should say. And the delta G is not really 100% correct here in affinity. Uh, please keep this in the back of your minds for your further modeling. So Back to the thinking of what is it really, this kind of affinity. We sat down over the years and thought, okay, we have to worry about new or other H bonds. These are important. They get three, three blobs for importance. Of course, we cannot have any clash. This is something that we can easily compute using a force field. But these relation terms definitely need to go somehow into this computation, computation of affinity. And the pi-pi interactions, pi-cat ion bonding, halogen bonding effects, etc., they are there. Uh, we can see them in electronic structure calculations, but they are not as important on average as are H bonds and clash and desolvation terms. So since the, the computation of affinity problem is already so complicated, at this point in time we have said, let's discard these for now. Now let's let's neglect these for now, and we could we can see actually that for example effects like pi pi interactions being favorable, or fennel fennel T type or stacking interactions etc. They can be largely already described by the effects uh, that we have here in these desolvation terms because you free water you give, you give them you give it this. Well, let, let me exaggerate a little bit this entropic freedom to leave them out to the bulk, which already by itself is favorable. So it's typically only roughly 10% of the full energetics that these electronic effects contribute. Of course, there are um, outliers from this rule, but on average, and this is what we try to have here in our model, we can neglect them for now. So we have said these most important terms here will, will compute using one system that we call HIDE. And the other parts, clash and the torsional energies, we can optimize using a force field. And there is also a means of visualizing these things. Mm -hmm. Everything we do is actually published. So don't worry. Um, you can read about all these secrets, which are no secrets at all. The nice thing about all this theory behind is that between these two terms here, there is nice connecting mathematical trick that we can use which connects these two entailing the the fact that we do not have to parameterize anymore and that's the log p so these two are related through the log p so you can imagine what is a strong h bond donor or receptor will also be hard to desolvate so these two are related and since there is the log p here which we can use to connect these two, we do not need any alpha and beta weighting parameters when we put these two into the mathematics underneath. And that's a very nice thing. So we are not into the parameterization business and we can simply um, use an atomic log P increment system to compute these things. And clash and torsion energies, as said, can be computed. On the other hand, then that means these Computations here are only valid if clash and torsional, torsional strain are low, and only then the values will be meaningful. The mathematics, only one quick slide, um, essentially are, the, are just the sum, no longer weighting parameters here in front of these terms, uh, over dehydration and H-bond or desolvation and H-bond terms. And you can see the anamnesis of these terms. It comes from the textbook chemistry, um, delta G equals minus RT ln K, 
and this is still in here. And the RTLNK has been rephrased using a lock P system and of course a computation of how well these things are accessible comparing before and after. So three big pros, we have the lock P which connects B2. We have no unphysical parameters here. We have only a bunch of lock P's uh, and this FSAT, which is a little term describing the temperature, uh, temperature dependency of the system. This computation is extremely fast. Um, we only need a few seconds, sometimes even less, where others need days to give us um, a free energy approximation here. You can now actually explore, play with ligand modifications on the fly, and we can visualize these things. So let's do this. Let's use 3ZLQ as an example here using CSAR 3.2, which is our latest addition to the portfolio. I say, I keep on saying it's, it's kind of every chemist's personal SAR assistant. So it's not a dedicated modeling tool. It's something that anyone really can play with and use. Although the version here suggests that it's an old tool out there for a long time, um, you should know that we switched to agile development a little while ago and this tool is only out for a little bit more than a year. So roughly every month, every three to six weeks, we have a release update and we do it exactly like the people from Google, for example, do with Chrome. As soon as something is ready and out, we can, we can release it. So um, that's what we do. So let me exit here from the presentation and fire up Caesar. And let's take a look at these things. So I shrink this a little bit so you guys can see everything. <clears throat> so you are prompted with a nice little startup screen and you can just enter a PDB code, 3ZLQ, and hit return. Once you have hit return, it downloads this from the PDB and gives you a neat little visualization. And here already, as alluded to earlier on, you see that we have multiple chains. Let me just put this into the center a little bit. And you see that we have two ligands in here. And these two ligands are actually the same ligands, as we can tell by the name here. And we can see that the estimated affinity here differs by three orders of magnitude already. You know? So the uh, experimentally recorded affinity is high nanomolar. So we'll see that these two here both have, um, have several things to ponder about. Yeah? So why is this computed affinity range not matching the experimental affinity range? And especially this guy here, it's totally off. But uh, to save time, I will neglect this guy here, which is even further off there, where there are acceptors facing each other, etc., etc., and concentrate on the one which is already closer uh, to the experimentally recorded affinity here. So if I click on this line, which I'll do now, we can zoom in uh, to this ligand here and we get this visualization that I, that I was referring to earlier on. So now we have the coronas. We call them height coronas. A green corona means this contributes favorably to the affinity. A red corona means this contributes unfavorably to the affinity. The larger, the more. So ideally, we would want to have large, big green coronas, and we would want to avoid red coronas at all. So let's take a look um, at, for example, an unsatisfied hydrogen bond. So if we zoom into this region here, I wait a little bit for you guys to, to be able to see these things. So we see, obviously, that there is an NH2 function which forms an H bond back here. Yeah, fair enough, that's, that's okay, but why is it not green? Well, the thing is, we have another NH function back here, and this is unsatisfied, although there is a carboxylate back here. But if we look a little bit closer to that structure, we can see, let me rotate this a little bit more didactically, we can, I hope you can see, that these two here, they are pointing towards northwest, whereas this carboxylate here is pointing kind of east, uh, maybe if I turn this a little bit further on, east and northwest. So you see that the H-bond geometries are simply not compatible. In other words, the geometric arrangement is of such nature that this NH function cannot really form a proper H-bond there. And the Hyde system underneath thinks 
that this guy here is desolvated but does not form a bond, so it's not rewarded. And we can actually take a look at these things by going to the label functionality in the in the very low right here, where we have a label functionality. I'm going to click now. And we can now use this label functionality to click on this nitrogen, which I do now, and a little, um, you know, like, uh, how should I say, like a post-it pops up and gives us an explanation. So we have a ligand desolvation, which, which means that we pay 8 kilojoules, almost 9 kilojoules here, desolvation on the ligand part, to free this guy from water. And likewise for the receptor, this is also would be much happier with water in front of its face forming interaction. But the interaction that we form on this side here is not able to overcompensate the two desolvation penalty increments that we have on this side. So in other words, even though in reality there may be a proper H-bond formed here, we do not see this and we should be alerted with respect to the crystal modeling that has been uh, taken here um, and uh, the arrangement here. So we should go back to the density, visualize the density and see whether it wouldn't be justified to perhaps move this a little bit further up north and this guy here a little bit further up, further down south. Also for pharmacophores, etc., this will play a role. Yeah. So the, the, the more you can correct early on, the better. So this is one example. Um, actually, with this I symbol here, with this I icon, you can see what protein atoms actually contribute to these computations here underneath. Mm -hmm. I click this I icon again. Okay, so we have something else down here. We have a carbon which is exposed to the solvent. I'm returning this. I'm turning this so that you guys can maybe see this a little bit more didactically. I'm holding still in a second. So like this, we have up here in the north that solvent exposed, and in the south we have this nitrogen which is buried in the ligands in the ligand bi in the binding pocket, I should say. So the question is, is that really true? So should that N here be buried or should it be uh, should it be exposed? It's it's a polar atom. So if I shrink this back here and do the labeling thing again, we can see that there is no interaction being formed, so no reward. The receptor is a little bit happy to have something uh, something different here in front of its face compared to water before, but the ligand is particularly unhappy with this polar uh, nitrogen being buried in this cavity. Likewise here, by the way, I take a shortcut to the labeling holding my L key pressed, L, and you can see how this changes here, L on, L off. L on, L off. So I can label the carbon. And likewise, here we see the desolvation terms uh, dominating this. But that's a very small red corona. So essentially, it is as unhappy as it was before, similar to the thought experiment that we had before with the fennel surrounded by water everywhere. So the question is, how about uh, changing these two here? We can now take the edit functionality and try out our hypothesis. So we say edit. And now you see that we have a little bit of fog here, which tells us where there is free room. Uh, but that's not our exercise now. Our exercise would be to, to flip this here, to say this nitrogen here is actually a carbon. So we can take either a keyboard shortcut, or we can just simply click C here, which changes this and slightly re-optimizes. And this guy here is a nitrogen. I'm going to press N on my keyboard now. One, two, three. And again, slight adjustment, and then I say score it and exit my editor here. And you can see that we now have created one green sphere, which is good, and one red, slight red sphere back here. So this contributes with two, almost three kilocalories, and this guy minus 1.8. So roughly it's an equilibrium compared to something unfavorable before where we had two red blobs. So this is what I was talking about before. We have a means of visualizing things. And with this, I want to uh, return to the, uh, to the presentation here for you uh, to learn a few more things. So you've seen it's really easy to look at things, get them visualized and uh, being alerted uh, in the sense of this webinar. Stay critical, look at your structures, visualize them. Uh, it's only a computation, but still it could give you very valuable insight to things. Torsional health. 
that's the second part that I wanted to talk about, but that's quickly, uh, quickly done probably because it's a very simple principle behind. So what Roche and Hamburg University uh, and ourselves set out to do is um, they looked at uh, small molecular crystal structures and did a statistical evaluation. And they put the statistical evaluation into like a tree-based um, structure in the computer so that given a substructure here, one can look up the respective torsions in a, in a table where the, uh, the distributions are stored and quickly color according to a green or like a traffic light system. Green meaning this I have observed relatively often in the Cambridge small molecule crystal data structure. This I have observed, but not too many times, but this is really rare. Yeah? And so now we have an interactive um, possibility to actually uh, look at these torsions and, for example, very quickly assess uh, pose statistics, etc., and what have you. So the green means frequently observed, yellow means unusual, however, a few times observed in the CSD, and the red means very rarely observed in the CSD. But remember, it's not an energetic statement, this is only a statistical statement. Hmm. So let's do an example. Let's reassess the torsions in CSAR. We have implemented this into CSAR lately. So if we go back to this first structure here, the crystal structure that we've recorded, there is down here in the very, very southwest of the tool, there is a TOR button, which we can click. And then we will switch off the, um, the, uh, the height coronas and switch on the torsional arrangement. So one, two, three, I'm going to click here. And here we can already see a red alert. And if I turn this around, you can guess what happens. It's a non-planar amide. So this, this crystallographic structure has al already been distorted in such a way that it is statistically very significant or significantly out of the typical distributions here. If I'm even a little bit more didactic, we can see that there is a slight twist in the amide functionality, which is already enough so that the system says that's really rare. It should really be more planar compared to this. Yeah. Also, um, back here, we have something else. I hold still in a second. Just trying to get this right for you guys. So here we have a f the, the the aromatic the um, uh, the uh, the aromatic ring, which is not really in plane with the rest uh, of this ethyl ether, ether here. So it, this is red. In other words, that's very unusual. If I turn this like this, you can see that this should be interplanar here. Well, you cannot see that this is actually the reason behind, but that's a very unusual torsion. Uh, so uh, it, it may be possible, but it's very, very rarely observed. So maybe a reason to double check your crystal structure structure or your, um, your poles that you generated, your dockings. Okay, so with this, one more example here on a slide. We have these uh, subtle examples where sometimes we see that the addition of, of a methyl does not only contribute extremely favorable to affinity, but we can also see that there is a torsional significance which is associated. So if we look at these estimations here from CSAR, we can see that the H is by far uh, the, the least active compound which has been measured, and the methyl and fluorine are roughly the same. Methyl and fluorine are roughly the same. Well, we underestimate slightly here. And chlorine methyl are roughly of the same order of magnitude. You can see that these estimations here now are polluted by not taking into account the torsional effects here. And this is what happens on the next slide. We see that with the methyl, we have a yellow, so kind of unusual the situation here. However, when we take the methyl away, we have a very, very unusual uh, conformation here, which indicates that strain maybe uh, maybe in this structure here, which even contributes to uh, to uh, to an even worse affinity here. So I'm coming to an end. We're approaching the uh, the hours limit. Hide in CSAR. The current status is um, yeah. So think about the desolvation penalty. Um, but we have no dynamics integrated yet, so it's kind of a static view on your system. Current major roadworks that we have in front of our face is uh, 
there are things that we worry about in terms of H2O. So for example, manual intervention, I know this water should be present there and do not let Protoss always know better about everything here. Um, covalent binding is definitely an issue where we have started thinking about protein flexibility, also longer term things. We have the first few uh, papers here uh, dropping in now. Um, our internal theoretically uh, motivated papers uh, at the top, you can actually find these on the uh, on the website if you go to biosavity.com slash CSAR. There will be a science tab that you can click on where you get more information. But also external applications now pop in. So if you want to take a look. Wrap up. Use these two tools, CSAR and VDIT, with the integrated height functionality to stay critical along all the way, scrutinize your crystals, check whether what is there is really there, get your alerts, pay attention to the geometries, and so on and so forth, torsional assessment, and um, get an informed selection of what chain to continue with in your modeling once you have multiple chains. You've seen this 3ZLQ structure was had a gigantic difference in the predicted affinity. And if you look at these structures more carefully, you will see that there are, that there are a lot of issues actually associated um, there to think about, etc. Rationalizing, in, in, in good cases, even predicting SAR effects. So uh, the motto is visualize the desolvation. CSAR is the only tool which actually does that. Uh, I'm not aware of any other tool out there, at least not accessible to anyone, which visualizes entropic and desolvation effects there. Assess selectivity estimates that has been done already and published in some of the publications mentioned before. Check your poses, dockings very, very easily and relatively uh, quickly also. And there is more to come. We are continuously improving the system. And uh, yeah, and with this, I give you the pointers uh, to where to download. So there is a website, biosavity.com CSA, that is a paid software, but there is always a seven day trial license. And as promised, uh, we will send out after the webinar, give us a little bit of time because that's usually, uh, we are over overwhelmed usually by people wanting to, to try with the uh, free webinar license that we'll send out, give us a few days to actually uh, get this all done and straightened out. Uh, and you can just drag and drop it into CSA in the uh, license dialog, which is actually up here, license. If you say information license, there is a field into which you drop your license and you're good to go. Um, and likewise for LEADED, which is a little bit more like a full throttle SBDD suite for both MathCams and CompCams. Um, it fe also features uh, the fragment-based uh, tools that we have and so on. There is a dedicated web page here. Um, and you will see free for academics. So these uh, torsional significance analysis, for example, there is a standalone prototype software that you can freely download as an academic and just use it. These are all um, on our Tech Trends web pages. And uh, with this, I would hand over to Carsten, say uh, thank you to you. All the best. Stay with us. Of course, we'll be around for the question sessions. Um, and one last uh, slide on the uh, reminder uh, on Matthias speaking next time. Carsten? Yeah, thanks, Marcus, very much for this uh, very intriguing webinar. Um, yeah, before we, we come to the questions, be reminded uh, of the next one. Uh, again, that's September 17th uh, at 6 p.m. Central European time about proteins from crystal structures to molecular design input. Um, so now let's come to the questions that have been popping in. There are actually quite a few. Um, a listener was asking about what about the quality of homology models when you were talking about the crystal structures. Um, can we use homology models um, just as well or can you say a few words to that? Yeah, that is definitely a good question. Since I mentioned that uh, currently what we do is a static view at things, um, the, the static view will be as good as the model is. Um, but still, we have a good experience with a bunch of homology models on our customer sites. Um, typically, people who have created the homology model 
know where they have more faith and where they have less faith. So uh, regions where, where they have, for example, from some kind of template structure, extremely high B factors, they are usually alerted about things that, uh, that are regions where they have, do not have very high confidence. So the higher the confidence in those regions, the more meaningful the height analysis and the visualization, etc., will be. So I would not discard this right away. A homology model is only a homology model, but typically with, uh, with a critical view at things, you should be able to actually use, um, use CSAR and HIDE, the integrated HIDE, to guide your further modeling. Yeah. Uh, there are statistics that we have done in late 2011 with the, with the math mathematical model, which has further matured over the years, and this showed almost exactly the same thing. So there was a correlation between homology model quality and the meaning meaningfulness, let's say, uh, of the associated height analysis. So never give up. Okay, good. Uh, maybe with uh, keeping an eye on the time, we should um, you know, keep the answers a little shorter. Mm -hmm. The following question. So there are a few more. Uh, if we assume the special case of ligand binding to a binding pocket that contains a metal ion, how is this accounted for in the calculation of delta G? Yeah, brilliant question. So, um, of course, there is no such thing like a defined or measurable log P of a metal ion, uh, which means that um, we have kind of done our best to guess something uh, for metal interactions. In other words, it's likely that we will introduce a systematic error here. Uh, and as a consequence, the values associated to, should be taken with care with respect uh, to be in absolute free energy values, but they should be okay um, with respect to relative um, to, to the relative rank order. So, given the fact that this is uh, a systematic error that is associated, you should be good to go. Um, one caveat, though, if you have very drastic changes of the metal coordination geometry, then you will introduce a second error. But we have good experience uh, on several cases where metals were involved. So also there, um, uh, I would say it's, it's a very powerful system, but uh, know that there may be a shift in the, in the free energy uh, estimations that we do. Uh, it's only a computation. Keep this in the back of your mind. Stay critical. Okay, um, then there was a question which I assume uh, corresponds to the Seesaw presentation. What about structures that do not contain ligands? Um, this would currently have to be taken as a service project on our side. So we have internal software that has not yet been released that will probably also never be released because it's prototype software which does not comply with our product standards. Uh, with respect to code stability, portability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But please contact us so that we can perhaps work uh, work on these topics on a um, in in a kind of a project based context. Um, because in principle, as you as you the uh, the person who asks this may imply, the theory is not uh, restricted to something like protein ligand complexes. We can do RNA, DNA. Protein-protein interfaces, etc., with exactly the same theory here. Yeah. Hopefully, this was a satisfying answer. What about the the protein preparation? Then maybe um, if we don't have a ligand, um, can we still do this? Yeah, Protos also works and operates with all its routines and statistics that it has underneath, also on a protein-only structure. Yeah, we have we have we have stuff and means for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think that was everything with respect to the question. And um, thanks again, Marcus, for this wonderful webinar. And again, be reminded about the next one. We welcome everyone on September 17, 6 p.m. Central European time. Thanks a lot um, for your attention today uh, and all your questions. And we will see you next month. Right, likewise. A grand thank you also from my side. Thank you, Carson, for moderating this webinar.